So I was reading a book this week about the Ten Commandments, and the author was talking about how central they are to the Mosaic tradition, which is to say the cultures and religions that have Moses as a shared important character in their history. I think they're more often referred to as the Abrahamic traditions, um, which takes a story back a few more generations to the stories of Abraham. But in talking about the Ten Commandments and how systems of ethics have been built on them in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, it does make sense to highlight Moses as the spiritual ancestor that we share in common, rather than Abraham. But of course, the word mosaic is used way more often as a noun than an adjective. A mosaic, lowercase m, is when all sorts of small or broken things are brought together to make something new and beautiful. Mosaic tradition, capital M, the shared history of Moses. Mosaic art, what is created when broken things are brought together. The pun is a weird coincidence of language, and I will not apologize for it. But I couldn't help but get stuck on the metaphor, because faith has never been something that we do alone. Faith has always been something that we have lived out in a community. The earliest generations of stories in our Bible, Cain and Abel, Noah, Abraham and Isaac, Jacob and Rachel and my girl Leah, they're stories about families and individuals, people who worship God but don't yet have an organized religion or a cohesive society. But then we get to the part of the story where Moses comes in, and then all of the Israelites are led out of slavery and through the Red Sea and into the wilderness and towards the Promised Land. God provides for all of the Israelites God advises Moses and the elders as they sketch out the rules and customs that will unite all of the Israelites. All of the Israelites from different tribes and backgrounds will belong to one society. They will support the priests who care for the Ark of the Covenant on their behalf. They will be governed by rules and customs that are set in place to offer justice to all of the Israelites, even the daughters of Zelophehad. Like mosaic art, all of the Israelites have been gathered together in all of their different sizes and colors and textures and brokenness. All of those pieces have become one beautiful mosaic. The mosaic breaks apart and is put back together quite a few times over the course of history, but it doesn't break back into individual pebbles. It breaks into a few pieces of a puzzle that remembers being part of something bigger. Pieces of a puzzle that know they were never meant to be alone. Pieces of a puzzle that will work to reunite itself. There's something in our souls and our faith and our histories that ties us together. And a large part of that something is the covenant between God and Moses that all of the Israelites will be one people. Mosaic tradition, the shared history of Moses. Mosaic art, what happens when broken things are brought together. It's all a mosaic mosaic, I guess we could say. I tried. Anyway, I, I set out to talk about how the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, one God and not many. And here I've been talking about puns and humanity longing to be one and not many. But our God alone being one God is what brought the Israelites together as one people. Because they had been liberated together by one God, they began to come together as one people to make decisions, even if those decisions haven't always been the right ones, because it often feels reckless to put our faith and trust in one thing, wouldn't it be better to hedge our bets, look for other gods, you know, just in case? And this is where I turn from puns and metaphors back to the first commandment and the single truth that the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You see, once upon a time, God helped Moses to lead the Israelites out of slavery and survive various dangers on the way to Mount Sinai 
which Moses then climbs so he can have a private conversation with God. While he's up there, God gives Moses a series of commandments carved on stone tablets. Moses takes them and heads back down, but when he reaches the camp, Moses discovers that while he was gone, the people started to feel anxious that God was no longer with them because Moses was no longer with them. So they had taken all their gold jewelry and melted it together. When it hardened, they looked at the shape and decided it kind of looked like a cow, maybe. So they concluded that the universe was telling them that they should worship this golden calf rather than the God who had disappeared with Moses up the mountain, or so they worried. Moses gets back to camp and sees all of this and is so shocked that he drops and breaks the stone tablets and has to hike all the way back up to get another set. The second time he comes down the mountain, the people are waiting for him, but they are intimidated by the power of God and tell Moses that they want him to do all the talking to God on their behalf. They're also intimidated by the fact that after Moses comes down the mountain the second time, either his face is radiating light or he has grown horns, depending on what translation you're reading. Yes, that is a thing. As you may know, and as the Israelites are about to learn, the first of those commandments that Moses brought down from the mountain is to have no other gods besides the Lord our God, the one God, the Lord alone. Obviously, the Israelites weren't keeping that commandment when they started worshiping a metal cow because they were afraid that the Lord our God wasn't enough. But I would invite you to consider another angle too. The Israelites were getting close to putting Moses at the same level as God. They panic and fear God may have abandoned them when Moses goes away for a few days and isn't there to reassure them. And even after they've learned to cope with their separation anxiety, they still beg Moses to be the voice of God for them. Was it too much of a risk to worship only one God? Was it too intimidating to have a single God with all the power of the universe? Maybe they could just compartmentalize, separate God from the voice of God. We humans do not have the power of the universe, and we are pretty well aware that we can't do everything, at least not if we're even the tiniest bit honest with ourselves. It's one thing to believe that God does have all the power in the universe, but really grasping that concept is another thing altogether. We can't help but view God as the creator of the seas, and in another breath, as the creator of the skies, and as the creator of the stars, and as the creator. It doesn't seem unreasonable to me that so many ancient peoples would divide up the power of the universe, as if creation were a group project in which not all parties were always on the same page, and a few personalities were always trying to get the most credit. How could one God be big enough and powerful enough to create and rule everything? If it were up to us, it would be a group project, but God isn't like us like that. The Ten Commandments as a whole are recorded two times in the Bible, once in Exodus and once in Deuteronomy. But the first commandment, to have no other gods besides because the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, that commandment is repeated throughout the Bible, sometimes gently, sometimes with exasperation, sometimes with disappointment, as God reminds us over and over that yes, God is big enough. God can listen to all of us. God can love all of us. God can watch over everything. God has enough grace to cover all our sins. God is strong enough to handle all of our anger, our grief, our doubt. God doesn't need to delegate power. God is one 
and God is enough, and God is more than enough. Our second scripture reading this morning comes to us from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances, that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy, so that you and your children and your children's children may live in awe of the Lord your God all the days of your life, and your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently, so that it may go well with you, and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. When the Lord your God has brought you into the land that God swore to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you, and when you have eaten your fill, take care that you do not forget the Lord, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall bow down in reverence to the Lord your God. You shall serve the Lord your God. By God's name alone you shall swear. Do not follow other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who are around you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. These words are recited twice daily in traditional Jewish prayers and have been written on the doorposts of countless millions of houses or carefully hung next to the front doors of countless millions of homes, including mine. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. These words are repeated throughout scripture. There is one God, and God is more than enough. You can trust in God. There is nothing that God could not do, I promise. God saw us through the wilderness, saw us through the exile, saw us through whatever wars or plagues or natural disasters that our ancestors lived through. The same God saw us through every time, the Lord alone. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Hear, over and over, until the truth of these words seeps into your soul. Recite these words to your children, and talk about them when you are at home, and when you are away, and when you lie down, and when you rise. The first commandment can be framed as a negative. Have no other gods besides the one God but it can also be framed as a positive. Remember that there is only one God, that there only needs to be one God, and rejoice that a God so powerful would also be so loving. Martin Luther once wrote that the entire book of Psalms was a meditation on the first commandment, all repeating the theme that there is one God, a God who rescues and listens and strengthens and protects, a God who is more than enough and more than we can comprehend. The authors of Deuteronomy wrote, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God and is present with you. The prophet Isaiah recorded the words of God, Yet I have been the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt. You know no God but me, and besides me there is no Savior. The psalmist wrote, As a deer longs for flowing streams, 
So my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God, the one God. This is the word of the Lord.